Hello, Calc Kids. This is Mr. Bean, and in today's lesson, we're going to talk about the derivative of an inverse trig function this time. And as opposed to just a regular inverse function, now we're going to do trig functions. So at the beginning of every, a every AP exam I have seen over the last 15 years, they always have this statement uh, to help you out, to understand some notation. And that is, if you have sine inverse, it's exactly the same thing as just saying arc sine of x. So either one of these means exactly the same thing. It's just the inverse of a trig function. So what are the derivatives of inverse trig functions? This is one of these painful things that you just have to memorize, but I'm going to show you that I have a way that I have been using with students that I really think works well to help you memorize stuff. Now, this is in a little bit different order than you're used to seeing trig stuff. And that is because look here on the left, I have sine, secant, tangent. And then over here, I have their complementary things. That's what the CO stands for. Cosine is complementary sine. So sine and cosine, secant, cosecant, tangent, cotangent. Okay, so let's, we're not going to worry about these yet because they're actually very, very similar to this. You'll see that in just a minute. So let me show you how to memorize this stuff. First off, if, okay, so again, we're focusing on just these three. If it starts with an S, it is going to have, go ahead and start writing this down. It is going to have subtraction and a square root. Again, if it starts with S, it has subtraction and square root for both of them. Okay, now notice on this one, I left a little bit of a space here. It's because something else is going to go there. So just give me a minute there. So write this down so far. So if it starts with S, it has subtraction and square root. Next up, on the first one, you have sine. See that little I in there? Kind of looks like a one. So that means the one comes first for the sine. Now this secant which is also subtraction and square root. It doesn't have the little one inside of it. And so the one comes last. Next is what goes in this blank spots here. That is going to be x squared, or in other words, whatever's inside the trig inverse trig function, whatever's right there, goes there, but you square it. I will come back to what goes right here in just a minute. I'm going to go down here to tangent. Now for tangent, we have, it does not start with an s, so there is no subtraction and there's no square root because there's no starting with an S. Now you could also think of the T looks like an addition sign. So there's an addition or tangent is add. People think of it that way too. I just remember that if it doesn't start, if it starts with an S, it has subtraction and square root. If it doesn't start with S, it has something else. Okay, and then since it's addition, it doesn't matter if you put the one in front or not. It's gonna be X squared plus one or one plus X squared. The order does not matter since it's addition and that's commutative. Now let's go back to this. When you look at this thing, here's how I remember this. Like, this is kind of stupid, but it works, okay? So for secant, what in the world goes right here? I remember this C. The C stands for, oh crap, there's an absolute value that goes right there. Okay, so when you look at these, you have, starts with S, you have subtraction and a square root for both of them. But the secant one has this little C here, which reminds you that, oh crap, I got an absolute value right in front of it. Okay. What about all these? These are exactly the same thing of this, except for since it starts with a C on every single one of them, the derivatives will be negative. So I have negative, 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 and then they are identical. So cosine inverse is exactly the same thing as sine inverse derivative, just with a negative in front of it. Okay, so you don't even have to memorize these, except for just remembering that since it starts with a C, it's negative. You have to memorize these first three, with the little tricks I showed you, hopefully that will make this work. So please pause the video now if you need to write the rest of that down because I'm going to move on. Let's put this into practice. So here we go, take the derivative of sine inverse. So I'm going to have one over, and now I'm going to have, it starts with an S, so I have a square root and a subtraction. The I is there reminding me that the one goes first. And then here is this thing squared, whatever's in there. So that's gonna be a nine X squared times, and then I do the derivative of the inside, which is just three. Okay, so I, again, I could just put the three on top if I wanted, but that's the answer. Now, please don't do this. This is wrong. Some students like to say, oh, well, this is minus the square root of nine X squared, and that just means one minus three X. So they simplify this to one minus three X. Don't do that. That's wrong. This whole thing is a group. It's the square root of the whole thing grouped together all as one thing. Okay, so that is the answer. If you wanted to simplify this and put the three on top, you could but then that's done. All right, tangent inverse. So there's no S in front. So that's gonna make this a little easier. We're just doing 
no square root and no subtraction. So I'm going to say 1 over, and then this thing squared, which is going to be 4x to the fourth, uh, and then plus 1 times the derivative of the inside, which is 4x. And then you could simplify this and make this 4x over 4x to the fourth plus 1. And that's the answer. Again, let me be a little bit loud. Don't simplify this. Some students think that they're you're allowed to do this. In fact, I'll, I'll do this, but don't, don't do this. I'm just going to do it real quick, and then I'll erase it. Oh, 4s cancel right there, and then that x cancels, and that's a 1. So this becomes 1 over x x cubed plus 1. That, you can't do that. You, you're not allowed to break apart a denominator like that. It's all one grouping, okay? So be careful about uh, simplifying these things incorrectly. Okay, last one of these, and that is, uh, so secant inverse. Rem notice how I put the arc secant, so I'll put both in this uh, in this lesson. So you get used to practicing with both the little inverse symbol here or versus the arc secant. Okay, so secant starts with an S, so we're going to have uh, 1 over, we're going to have a square root and a subtraction, but there's no 1 here, like the sign has a little pretend 1 in the middle. So we're going to have this go first, the 1 goes last, and then that squared. So that's 25x squared. And then the secant, oh, it has a C. Ah, oh, crap, it has a C. So we've got to remember to do the absolute value of 5x. And then times the derivative here is 5. Okay, now we could take this 5 and that 5 and cancel it. So then that simplifies down to where we have 1 over the absolute value of x times the square root of 25x squared minus 1. And again, you cannot simplify this square root symbol here by taking these individually. You're not allowed to do that. It's a whole grouping. Okay, so now we've just simplified a secant one, which leads us to the next part of our notes. And that is, it's a little tricky sometimes to simplify secant derivatives, secant inverse derivatives, I should say. So I'm going to give you these two real quick just to show you how this works. We want to try to simplify this. So are you allowed to simplify through an absolute value? Well, you are if you're really careful about it. So what I am going to show you is that if I just say, let's plug in an x equals negative 1 here. Let's plug in any negative number I want, just a negative. I don't care what the answer is. I just want to check and see, is my answer positive or negative? So when you square something, you're going to get a positive number on top. And on bottom, when you take the absolute value, you're going to get a positive number on bottom. So a positive over positive is going to give you a positive answer. So now let's simplify this. So 9 divided by 3, I'm going to get a 3. x squareds cancel. So though those are gone. And I have left, let's leave off the absolute value for a minute. And then I have left, uh, what, that 3 is gone. And then I just have one single x left over. And then I have square root of 9x to the 6th minus 1. So now the question is, do I put an absolute value around this or not? So look what my answer is supposed to be. It's always going to be positive. Even if I plug a negative number in, my answer will be positive. So if I look here, if I plug in a negative number, that's going to create a negative answer, and I don't want that. I want there to always be a positive answer because I checked. Before I reduced, I checked to see if it was going to be a positive or negative. All right, let's do that here. So let's just plug in an, a negative number real quick, easy one like negative 1. So on top, I'm going to have a negative number. On bottom, I will have a positive because I'm doing the absolute value, so positive. So my answer is going to be a negative number when I plug a negative number in. So let's now simplify. 4 and 2 are going to reduce. The x cancels with one of those x's, so I'm going to be left with 2 over x. I'm going to leave the absolute value off for now. Over the square root of, uh, what have I got here? 4x squared minus 1. So now the question is, do I put an absolute value around this? Well, look here. If I want the answer to be negative and I plug a negative number in, if I plug a negative number into this, that is negative. That's exactly what I want. If I put an absolute value around it after I simplify, then that's no longer a negative answer. And as I saw, before I simplified, I checked to see if I would need a negative number or not, and I do on this case. Okay, so that would be the simplified answer for this one. So that's just simplifying after you take the secant inverse derivative. It's a little tricky on that part. The last thing we have to cover is actually review. 
So for some of you, this will be really good review and it's going to be so, super easy. And for others of you, you're going to be like, what? I've never seen this before. I'm not going to do a full lesson on this. It's just a really quick thing. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, explain to you why the domain of an inverse trig function is the way it is. I'm just telling you what it is, okay? If you want to learn more about why, you can go back to one of our pre-calc lessons and look at inverse trig functions. Okay, so this one, sine inverse. A sine in, uh, an inverse uh function does not use the entire unit circle. It does not keep going around in a circle over and over and over again. A sine inverse function actually only goes with these values. It goes from negative pi over two to zero up to pi over two. Okay, so that's what this is talking about, negative pi over two to pi over two. But because it's an inverse, this is now the output. It's the y values. And the domain is what we're used to being the output because it's switched, right? Sine versus sine inverse. Okay, now the cosine graph over here now, the cosine inverse, this is where we deal with it on the unit circle, from zero to pi. Okay, so the range, the output's gonna be an answer between zero and pi. And we're only plugging numbers into the function that are between negative one and one. Okay, so this is the, on the unit circle, this is what we deal with. And then tangent, this last one is from negative pi over two. It's just like sine, except for the difference here is that this would be an open circle and an open circle, because notice y it, uh, is less than pi over two, or negative pi over two is less than y, while over here we included it. And the reason is because tangent is the same thing as sine over cosine, and when you're doing the cosine can't have a zero on the bottom. You'd have a uh, undefined fraction here, and that's why we don't include the endpoints. Okay. So now how do we do this? Why are we doing this? It's because you're gonna have to do a little bit of things like this when you do tangent equations, equations of a tangent line. You'll have to be able to plug this in and figure out what the value of that is for your y value for the tangent line. So let's see what this is saying. Let's figure out what is sine inverse at the value of square root of three over two. So what this is saying is, I'm gonna write it down here. This is saying, what is the angle if your answer to that is the square root of three over two. So that's what this means. You're trying to figure out when do you get a square root of three over two on the unit circle. So you come back here and it's only on these values. So sine is the y value. So it's up here, it's positive, square root of three over two. And it is going to be that point right there, zero, one, two, yeah, pi over three. So we come back to our answer. This is, uh, the answer to this is pi over three. All right, this one. Cosine inverse of x over four, so that's gonna be cosine inverse of negative two over four is negative one half. So again, what does this mean? This means what angle do you get, at what angle do you get an answer of negative one half for cosine? That's what this is saying. Come back here, cosine theta, where do I have a negative one half? That's gonna be this one right here, two pi over three. So that's my answer, two pi over three. And then the last one, tangent inverse. This is saying, uh, when does tangent of an angle have an answer of one over the square root of three? So if you remember, tangent is sine over cosine. So it's saying, when do you have sine of theta going to be one, cosine is gonna be the square root of three, that weird stuff, sine over cosine, let's think about that. When is sine one and cosine, so they're both positive, it's gonna be right here. Yes, because I'd have square root of three over two, comma one half. Those are my sine divided by cosine values, one over square root of three. And that's exactly what I want. So it is at pi over six. Okay, so yes, that's supposed to be a review, but I have found that most calculus students struggle with this quite a bit. Uh, you don't spend a lot of time on it in most algebra two or pre-calculus classes. So that was just a quick review to help you out with this lesson. All right, that's everything then. So rock that mastery check and I'll see you back in the next lesson.